thank you to the organizers for letting me speak. And I would like to start out by saying, I was a little concerned about being put into this section because the two talks before me were very, very you know, exciting about the formal developments in quantum information. And I thought I was gonna have an incredibly rough transition to what I'm gonna talk about, but it will hopefully smooth itself out as we go, given the great sort of conclusion that Raphael gave us. So my job in this talk is to sort of distill for you this upcoming community white paper that a lot of people have put a lot of time into, and it's sort of approaching 100 pages right now, but it's not quite done. Um, for various reasons unknown to me, uh, the credit to this you know, Herculean undertaking really belongs to Christian and Zora, the, the lead authors on it. But instead, you're going to have to listen to my opinions. So what is the current state of quantum computing today? Um, it's you know, depressingly nasty, brutish, and short. We're talking about having you know, tens to hundreds of qubits on today, where our gate fidelities are only like 90 to 99%. And what this really you know, turns into is that if you try and think about the comparison to the classical computers we have today, we're talking about the ability to do something like 100 to 1,000 clock cycles if we're lucky. And these things sort of run you know, on the order of you know, a thousand of them per second, if you could really go that long. So these are, you know, astronomically away from anything close to what classical computing can do today in terms of the speeds at which we can do it. And so you might say, well, I've just completely depressed you. What's the point of coming to Snowmass and telling you about quantum computing then? So, you know, by the next Snowmass, we're expecting to ramp up quite a bit in terms of the actual hardware we're going to have access to with people, you know, both at IBM talking about superconducting qubits, uh, people at IonQ talking about doing uh, trapped ions and the SQMS center, which I'm a part of, uh, about using superconducting radio frequency cavities that we use at particle accelerators, in fact, to, to work and do your bosonic quantum computer. And it's sort of, you know, all the groups that are involved in designing these machines right now are talking about that in the next 10 years, we're going to have something like a thousand qubits that are accessible to us with varying amounts of quantum error correction and various amounts of circuit depths we'll be able to access. And what you should think about in that case for a high energy physicist is that this is essentially the amount of resources that Kreutz and his collaborators were using in the late 70s, early 80s to learn about uh, non-perturbative quantum field theories in the sense of doing the Z2 gauge theory on a four dimensional lattice. So in 10 years, I expect very much to see these sort of very, very preliminary developments of how does an actual non-perturbative quantum field theory act in Minkowski space, something that's sort of been missing to us in a broad way for a long time. So, you know, there's going to have to be a lot of work, both numerically and theoretically, in order to reach that goal. But that's sort of where we might imagine ourselves being by the next snowmass. And sort of to go to a more fundamental point, which is what the previous speakers were talking about, sort of fundamentally, high energy physics is about quantum information. It's about quantum mechanics. And perhaps it shouldn't surprise you then that classical computers are inadequate to solve all of our problems that we would like to solve. So, you know, the way that a computer scientist person would say this is, you know, the problems a classical computer can solve efficiently is either P or BPP, so bounded polynomial or probabilistic polynomial time. And at a, you know, computational science level, the bounded quantum, uh, quantum polynomial is just a bigger computational complexity class. And the problems we'd like to solve all sort of sit in there. So it shouldn't shock us that it takes a better computer than a classical computer to do quantum, comp uh, quantum physics. And... So what are the types of you know, high energy physics that this is going to influence? And in the white paper, we sort of outline five sort of key physics drivers that are going to be interesting both in the range of snow mass and then beyond as we get larger and larger computers. So you know, the first one that of course I'm from Fermilab, so I have to mention is neutrino you know, physics and astrophysics. And this idea that you know, the collective oscillations of these you know, inherently quantum field theory things uh, need to be taken into account. Um, you know, again, I'm from Fermilab, so I have to mention that collider phenomenology is something where we're going to need to think more deeply about how the actual quantum interference of uh, colliders works. Um, if you want to think about strongly interacting matter in and out of equilibrium, just the non-perturbative nature of these strongly interacting theories typically limits what you can do either analytically or computationally. And so if you want to think about them in or, you know, far away from equilibrium, uh, you need to be thinking about using, you know, computational methods. Um, cosmology, of course, if you want to talk about doing non-perturbative quantum field theories in the early universe, that's a place where, you know, problems will arise for you. And then sort of finally, the most speculative one is just if you want to do non-perturbative quantum gravity, if you want to have a handle on how that works, you know, you can write down something that looks like a path integral and then you'll have to shake your head and say, if I can't do it perturbatively, I'm sort of stuck. Well, a quantum computer will allow you, you know, once it's large enough to formulate that problem in a way that you can at least test it and do experiments of the type that sort of Raphael was advocating for trying to learn about 
without having to go out into the, you know, the real world and learn about it. You can at least do some preliminary studies and say, is my theory even well-defined in a non-perturbative sense? And that will be, you know, give us new access to information about how these things work. So if you take all five of those, you can start to compile for yourself an enormous list of things. And it again, sort of fundamentally comes down to the statement of, if you would like to know about the non-perturbative nature or the non-equilibrium nature of a quantum field theory or a you know, quantum gravity in Minkowski space-time, you are almost forced into using a quantum computer to do the numerics of it, if you want to be able to get access to large volumes and large systems. And so sort of what are the questions that we sort of have to sidestep today because we don't have access to a computer that can do that? Well, you know, when we talk about doing parton showers, we sort of have to finagle our way around ignoring the fact that we know at some level the quantum interference between all the possible outstates of my collider are messing with each other in a complicated way. Um, you know, there is the K KSS conjecture that tells you that the entropy over, or the entropy over, let's see, the energy, uh, sorry, I'm blanking. Just the fact that the entropy of a quantum field theory is bounded by a conformal field theory is one over pi, uh, four pi. And the question is, well, if I have a quantum computer, all of a sudden I can test all the possible quantum field theories I like and ask what their viscosity over their entropy is. There we go. And say, do these things really across their entire regime always, saturate, or always avoid going below this bound? I can ask, you know, how is it the quantum field theory is actually thermalized? Because we like to think about things in terms of eigenstates. And so this eigenstate thermalization hypothesis is a very complicated thing to sort of imagine constructing non-perturbatively. And then you can sort of just go through this list and say there are lots and lots of things where having access to a computer in the same way that classical computers taught us a lot about non-perturbative classical field theory and taught us some things about non-perturbative quantum field theory that you're gonna be open to. So, you know, what are the problems that in the next 10 years people are going to be working on to think about in terms of bringing all of those, you know, big physics questions to the forefront? So, you know, there's a massive sort of puzzle of things that you have to deal with and think about, starting with, if you want to do quantum field theories and inquire any kind of bosonic degrees of freedom at all, that infinite dimensional Hilbert space needs to be either truncated to some finite things so you can put it on a finite computer, or you need to find a very clever way to represent that continuous variable. And so when we're in a resource strap era of the next decade or so, that is you know, sort of the question that people think about the most at this point. But even once you do that, there's a very subtle quantum field theory question going on like, so what? I know how to put quarks and gluons onto a quantum computer, I don't know how to you know, represent the proton. I don't know what its wave function truly looks like in terms of quartz and gluons. And so the entire question of how do I set up the initial conditions that I want to evolve is going to have to be addressed. And there's something you know, deeply theoretical about that that I can't just sort of hand you any algorithm that will work out for you. you know, even once you know what state you want to put on, you know, what are the Hamiltonians you're going to use to time evolve with? What are the types of gates and operations that the actual hardware you're interfacing with is going to allow you to implement and does that impose limitations on what theories we can study? And then sort of finally, you know, how can we even observe uh, the things that we want to measure? So, you know, because it's a quantum computer, this is a quantum system, you can sort of put air quotes and say, wave function collapse is the way that I do have to do my measurements. And, you know, unlike a lot of the other things where we talk about wave function collapse, it's either people thinking deep, deep about how, you know, quantum mechanics can be formulated properly. At some fundamental level, this has to be dealt with seriously to understand what this quantum computer is giving us out. And so both in terms of a practical matter of constructing your observables and in terms of understanding how quantum computers work at a deep quantum information level, this is going to be something that's going to you know, need to be tackled. And then again, if you're sort of closer to the grindstone, um, you need to be thinking about how to mitigate and you know, correct for the errors that these machines have because they're noisy. And you know, there's been lots of work done about how to use quantum error correction in general to solve, you know, to make a universal quantum computer can solve anything. But if you're thinking about, I would like to do lattice field theory, I would like to do non-perturbative quantum gravity in the near future, it's absolutely, you know, essential to be thinking about, is there a special way to consider quantum error correction that is only robust to the errors that I care about for mine and not some more general thing, and that could help you accelerate to get there faster. And sort of as was suggested in the talks before, we also are starting to learn that quantum error correction has this deep connection to holography and other things that are sort of deep, deep in our theoretical physics background that we'd like to know about. And so you can both, you know, accelerate quantum computing's development and learn something deep about quantum field theory at the same time. So, like I said, one of the big problems that everyone's thinking about right now is the fact that these infinite bosonic Hilbert spaces need to be encoded somehow. And you know, the naive thing that most of us think about is, well, I'm going to consider a digital quantum computer, so I need to take something like the sphere, which is a gauge group, 
and I need to discretize it in some way, shape, or form. And you might ask, well, what makes a good scheme? And you know, the obvious one is the ones that use less quantum resources are going to be better because my quantum computer will take less effort. But you know, that sort of can easily subtly miss the point because the second you start taking something like a gauge symmetry or any symmetry for that matter, and you break it, you need to be worried about how is it going to be restored? And you might sort of you know, wave your hand and say, that's a numerical problem. Uh, but this is really not a triviality. This is something about you saying that I believe the RG flow of the model I'm going to put down has a limit in which it is connected back to the true theory I care about. And so there's been lots of work done on this and people are sort of starting to discover, sorry, we're not quite ready for that, that there are discrete systems that are capable of representing continuous gauge symmetries in a way that they properly reproduce the full results of these much more complicated continuous symmetries you like. And that's very surprising to most of us. And sort of for me personally, uh, as I was already discussing, like, can the scheme be, you know, simulated classically? Am I allowed to do Euclidean path integral calculations with the same digitization so that I can learn about the non-perturbative nature of these problems before I have to get to the quantum computer of a sufficient scale to really test them? And so if you have this ability to do the analytic continuation of your digitization so that you can do something in Euclidean time, you can learn a lot. And so this sort of nice paper that just came out recently by myself and others showed that if you use a particular digitization scheme, you can reproduce the pure glue glue ball masses to you know, the percent with which we are accurately measuring them in lattice QCD today. And so sort of the conclusion we're starting to come to is that we don't actually need the full closure of these groups in order to get sufficient accuracy to make predictions with them. And that this can be you know, leveraged to save us a lot of effort. Um, to sort of bring you back down to earth about what the prospects are, sort of the current best estimate right now for extracting something like the shear viscosity, which people are sort of suggesting is a near term goal, uh, is, you know, 10 to the five qubits and 10 to the 49 T gates. And where that comes from is you say, well, I need to put quarks and gluons on a lattice that needs to be about, you know, 10 cubed. I'm going to use the simplest Kogut Susskind Hamiltonian. I'm going to truncate the number of electric field values I allow. I'm going to trotterize it and then construct some loose air bound. I'm going to decompose all the unitary gates I need into native ones so that I can do floating point operations. And I'm going to assume that the air between trotterizing and synthesizing is 10 to the minus eight. And a Herculean effort was done to derive a formula. They gave us some rough estimates. And their conclusion was that our analysis shows that with 99 plus 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 percent, um, you know, of these gates stem from having to do floating point operations on your quantum computer. And for this particular problem, which is actually doing heavy ion collisions, not the slightly simpler uh, viscosity, uh, it'll take less than three years of runtime on a next scale quantum supercomputer. And so that is where we are today in terms of our estimates of where this thing could be. I will tell you that personally, I think this number is wildly overly pessimistic and it's probably about 20 to 25 orders of magnitude smaller with just the improvements we know how to do today. And so, you know, what is the actual cost to do something 10 years from now is entirely uncertain and a serious devotion from the community to figure that out is going to drive this number down. And you know, in the same way that people were surprised where Lattice got in 40 years, I think we'll be surprised where quantum computers get us in 40 years. Last but not least, um, quantum simulations of high energy physics requires you know, a completely new workforce that have skill sets far beyond what any of us in this room have trained to do. And because it's a completely sort of new field where we need lots and lots of skills, um, there's lots and lots of exciting opportunities for people at all levels and I will unabashedly say that I have high school and undergraduate students working with me. Um, so, you know, we need to be thinking about how we're going to get money to pay for this new workforce and developing it the way we'd like to do it. And, you know, I am currently part of a, a summer school for undergraduate interns. So that's them right there. And five of them are now working with me for the whole year. And, you know, people are writing, you know, quantum computing textbooks that are starting to train the workforce at high school and undergraduate level now. And, if we want them to have, in addition to their quantum computing skills, high energy physics skills and high energy theory skills, we have to be part of that conversation. Otherwise, we'll have to come in with the workforce we already have and then have to train them at the graduate level to learn a whole new set of skills that are going to you know, spend their whole grad school just learning technical things that we could have been preparing them earlier for. So in conclusion, it's, it's time to go. Like This is going to be something that's going to be a huge impact 40 years from now. And in the next 10 years, we're going to see a lot of rampant wrap up of both hardware and algorithmic developments to learn something deep about non-perturbative quantum field theories and quantum gravity. And uh, with that, I will conclude. And I guess it's time for questions. Thank you, Hank, for that uh, very stimulating talk. Um, maybe mildly depressing for some of us, but anyway. Uh, so now we have time for some questions in the room. 
So the perfect quantum computer for uh, collider physics is the Large Hadron Collider. Uh, and uh, clearly you don't want quantum computing to just reproduce a collider. So there has to be some sort of kind of uh, optimization problem between classical computing and a full scale experiment. So kind of where do you see that? For example, in the, uh, um, the ADA estimates, the viscosity uh, estimates, I mean, clearly 10 to the 49 or however many gates is ridiculous. You might as well just build a, an experiment. So where do you see kind of the prospects for quantum computing saturating what we could actually understand? Sure. So with that, I will come back to this slide because I, I colored it the way I did on purpose. So if, if what you said is I would like to compute the non-perturbative viscosity of QCD at arbitrary temperatures, you know, this is the estimate people gave us. Um, the history of lattice QCD itself tells us that, you know, using unimproved Hamiltonians is like using unimproved actions, which was basically given up in the 80s to do improved things. Because, you know, if you take the lattice errors and all of a sudden you decrease them from being, you know, linear and quadratic to alpha or a to the four, then all of a sudden, you know, the lattice size you need is smaller. The number of operations you need to do decreases. So this red thing right here is going to bring you down by several orders of magnitude. Um, the fact that this loose bound is being used is known to give wildly pessimistic results for how many gates you need. And that, if you do sort of the naive estimates that people, again, in the last couple of years have started showing better ways to do that analysis, brings this thing down by, you know, 10 to 15 orders of magnitude. Um, this idea that you need to get your accuracy to 10 to the minus 8 is also a bit dodgy to me because if I'm telling you that the lattice field theory, the actual, you know, quantum field theory errors are only going to be something like 1%, which is sort of standard, then, you know, asking that this thing be 10 to the minus 8 instead is substantially increasing this, you know, denominator and causing problems there. So, you know, all of this is going to come together to bring us down to something more into the realm of a realistic classic or quantum computer computation for this thing. And the point is, is sort of unlike the LHC, which is, as you say, the perfect quantum computer, uh, I don't get to choose what QCD acts like at the LHC. I'm sort of stuck with whatever it wants to be. Whereas on my class or on my quantum computer, I can toy around with it and play, you know, approximations that extrapolate to it and save me resources as well. Is there anyone out there in Zoom land for one very, very brief question? Yeah, we got a hint from Stephen Gottlieb. Steve, do you want to unmute yourself and ask your question? So is a quantum exascale computer one that can do 10 to the 18th uh, gate flips with 10 to the 18th gates or, you know, what's the definition? Yes, that is the definition. The definition is it can do as many quantum operations as a classical exascale computer can do classical operations is the way that these authors have defined it. But is there a minimum number of qubits as well? Yeah, it, it is exascale in both memory and in, in operations. Thank you. Thanks. All right, let's thank Hank again.